tonight, disaster in Libya. Catastrophic flooding kills thousands, with 10,000 more missing. The devastating images of a city underwater. We fear quite a large part of the family has unfortunately died. And a humanitarian effort hampered by politics. Disturbing discoveries in a Calgary kitchen at the center of a massive E. coli outbreak. Violations related to food handling, sanitation, and pest control. The search for the source after hundreds of kids got sick. Plus, Apple's power trip. That is the biggest announcement out of this event. The major change to the iPhone charger. Wow. Wow. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. The brute force of nature has snatched entire neighborhoods into the sea in Libya, where tonight the death toll is more than 5,000, with 10,000 feared missing. Here's fresh satellite imagery after floodwaters smashed through two dams and cut through the port city of Derna, a quarter of it gone. And here is what it looked like before the powerful Mediterranean storm crashed ashore. CTV Genevieve Beauchemin on the catastrophe and how the country's political divide may have contributed to the destruction. The people of the port city of Derna began to bury their dead. So many were killed by storm Daniel mass graves are the only option. Several bodies have come from area hospitals that, along with a large section of the city, were destroyed by floods. We counted the victims as they were lying in the hallway, says this doctor. Those who are identified by family or friends are buried. The devastation is testament to both the force of the storm and the vulnerability of Libya after a decade of chaos over control of the country. Powerful Storm Daniel is the Mediterranean's equivalent of a hurricane known as a medicaid. This storm was so extreme is that the Mediterranean was about five degrees warmer than average. It dumped more than 440 millimeters of rain in a single day, eight to ten times the monthly average in the region. For context, that's more than three times the deadly amount that fell over one devastating day in July in Nova Scotia. This speaks to sort of really uh, what climate change is doing. The floodwaters in Libya washed away entire neighborhoods and smashed through two dams upstream from Derna, unleashing rivers of water. Some say local authorities neglected those structures meant to protect Derna as Libya's rival factions in the east and west clashed. And that's devastating to those who lost aunts, uncles, cousins. This, for me, is a direct cause or, or a partial cause of, of the death, of the deaths of those thousands. Including your family members? Including, yeah, the at least sort of 11 family members we know of so far. The aftermath of the tragedy did bridge some of the divide. The Tripoli-based government in the West was among those sending in aid to the struggling East. Global Affairs says more than 1,300 Canadians are registered in the region, but it has no reports of any missing or dead. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. The majority of the 100,000 Canadians of Moroccan descent live in Quebec. And today, that province pledged $1.5 million in aid to Morocco, where hope of finding survivors after the earthquake is fading. <laughs> Rescue teams recover bodies from under the rubble of this remote town. Survivors are now living in makeshift tents for the fourth night. In Marrakesh, Morocco's king visited the injured at a hospital and donated blood. Nearly 3,000 people have died. Back on this side of the world, Atlantic Canada is bracing for a storm that is weakening but expanding. Let's bring in CTV meteorologist Kaylin Mitchell, who's tracking the path. And Kaylin, walk us through the timeline over the next few days. Thank you very much. Well, Hurricane Lee is a Category 3 hurricane. Forecasts, though, to weaken to a Category 2 and then Category 1 as it runs into some cooler waters sitting just to the west of Bermuda. Then we'll approach and move into the southern marine areas of the Maritimes as a Category 1 hurricane very early Saturday morning. From there, as it progresses across the region and moves up towards the Gulf of St. Lawrence, expected to become a post-tropical storm system, which would be something more similar to one of our winter 
overtime nor Easters. Now, while we're happy to see that Lee is expected to be a Category 1, which is lower than both Hurricane Fiona and Hurricane Dorian were, both of which had widespread impacts in the Maritimes as equivalent to Category 2 hurricanes, there is something to watch out for with this storm system, and that's the fact that it is expected to become larger in size as it moves northward. So the intensity coming down, but the size increasing. Currently, the strongest of the winds and rain all wrapped up around the center of that hurricane, but you'll notice as it moves northward, uh, it gets larger, sort of the rain and the winds spreading out from the center. So there may still be some fairly widespread impacts in the maritime region, including widespread risk of seeing some power outages, possibility that areas that see the heaviest of the rain could see some flooding and flash flooding and some rough coastal conditions. Omar. All right, Kaylin, thanks. A visibly furious Premier of British Columbia promised action today after a man who killed his own daughter went on a stabbing rampage at a festival in Vancouver's Chinatown. CTV's Abigail Turner has more. A weekend event of performances and music meant to draw people to Vancouver's Chinatown and showcase the neighborhood's resiliency was met with a horrific ending. I am so angry. I am white hot angry. Strong words used by the premier to describe his reaction to three people being stabbed Sunday night during the festival. The accused, an inmate released on a day pass from the Colony Farm Forensic Psychiatric Hospital in Coquitlam. 64 year old Blair Donnelly was found not criminally responsible for killing his 16 year old daughter in 2006. Three years later, he stabbed another person while on a day pass. I cannot fathom how someone who murdered his daughter, was released in 2009, went out and stabbed somebody else, somehow able to go out and buy a knife, go to Chinatown and stab three people. How is that possible? EB promised to investigate how Don Ellie was granted a day pass. I, I just cannot, cannot imagine how this happened. Earlier this year, his government pushed Ottawa to reform Canada's bail system to target repeat offenders after he directed new teams of prosecutors, probation and police officers to focus on the issue in B.C. Absolutely draws into the question of how uh, people like that receive and get a day pass. The mayor of Coquitlam hopes people view the situation with empathy. The stabbings were done by the illness, not by the, the individual, and that is something that we all have to try to keep in mind. Don Ellie has been charged with three counts of aggravated assault and remains in custody. There's no update to provide on his victims, a 60 year old couple and a 20 year old woman. Abigail Turner, CTV News, Vancouver. And on the second day of testimony in the trial of a man accused of killing a Muslim family in London, the Crown presented dramatic pieces of evidence. On June 6, 2021, Nathaniel Veltman allegedly drove into the upsells, then took the truck to a mall parking lot. He approaches a cab driver who testified in court today that he was told to call police. There is a truck here, and he said he hit somebody. It was me. It was me. It was truck. me that did it. Now come arrest me. What's your name? Dave Veltman. Are you injured? No, nope, I did it on purpose. Within minutes, Veltman gets on his knees and is arrested. The 22-year-old faces terror-related murder charges. We have disturbing new details of glaring lapses by a daycare kitchen in the middle of a massive E. coli outbreak in Calgary. A new report shows food for children was cooked in a kitchen infested with cockroaches. Here's CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier. Shut down now for a week. Alberta health officials believe this is ground zero in a growing E. coli outbreak, a caterer that provides food to 11 daycares. It almost certainly originated from the central kitchen. A report on the inspection of the facility released today includes critical violations two live cockroaches, at least 20 more in traps. A dispenser for sanitizer wasn't working and meals were being delivered without equipment for keeping food cold. It certainly highlights that there were some critical issues. And to think I walked past those kitchen doors twice a day. Samantha Brett still isn't sure when or if her kids will go back to Fueling Brains Academy as some of the organization's eight Calgary locations start to reopen. We want to have confidence in, in Fueling Brains that 
our kids are going to be safe going back, and it seems the reopening is very rushed. The number of cases has climbed from 56 on September 5th when the outbreak was declared to 264 today. 25 patients are still in hospital. 22 have the serious complication hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, a disease that attacks the kidneys. Six are receiving dialysis for kidney failure. He's slowly improving. Sarah McDonald's four-year-old son is one of the children diagnosed with HUS, but she says it's a mild case. I certainly feel lucky. I know that there are parents that are going to walk a long, dark road with HUS. I want to start by expressing my deepest concern. Today, the Alberta government spoke publicly on the outbreak for the first time. I can assure everyone that we are committed to getting to the very bottom of this. The outbreak has prompted calls for more stringent rules at commercial kitchens like this one. Today, health officials promise to make any changes found necessary by an ongoing investigation, but there's no word on how long that might take. Omar. All right, Bill, thanks. Overseas now and an international visit getting the world's attention. On board his armored train, Kim Jong-un arrived in Russia ahead of an expected meeting with Vladimir Putin. The North Korean dictator was met at a border town by a military honor guard and a member of Putin's cabinet. Kim is traveling with his defense minister and may be willing to supply Russia with weapons and ammunition in exchange for economic aid. Under pressure from the hard right, U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is launching an impeachment inquiry into U.S. President Joe Biden over his family's business dealings. These are allegations of abuse of power, obstruction, and corruption. And they warrant further investigation. House Republicans allege Biden benefited off the dealings of his son Hunter and lied about it, but they've provided no evidence. A repeated target of intimidation by China testified in front of U.S. Congress today. Canadian Conservative MP Michael Chong and his family were allegedly threatened after he criticized Beijing's egregious human rights record. Now, Chong is calling for a coordinated response on Chinese meddling. Here's CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malvin. Canadian MP Michael Chong came to Washington to sound the alarm, sharing firsthand what it's like to be targeted by communist China. My experience is but one case of Beijing's interference in Canada. Many, many other cases go unreported and unnoticed, and the victims suffer in silence. Speaking out about Beijing's brutal treatment of its Muslim Uyghur minority in 2021, says Chong. Clearly, a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. Put him on China's radar. Given a rare invite to Capitol Hill, he warned the Americans about Beijing's strategy to silence critics. Recently, the PRC has used a tactic of creating wanted lists and offering bounties of the arrest of those from Canada. These tactics cannot be tolerated in a free and sovereign country. These lawmakers are more than convinced, citing the latest Chinese conspiracy on social media, suggesting the Maui wildfires were some kind of U.S. weather weapon, and that has outraged this senator. The Chinese Communist Party is now trying to sow discord among Americans as we sadly bury our own dead in Hawaii. This is outrageous. Don't you think we should be going on offense? And I think we as democracies need to acknowledge that this is a very real threat. Chong's urging the U.S. and Canada to crack down on foreign meddling together, calling for a registry of foreign agents in Canada like the U.S. has. Do you feel threatened still? Is your family still threatened? No, I, I am emboldened by the PRC's targeting of me because what it, what it demonstrates is that we are being affected in denouncing their violations. And Chong is determined, it seems, to continue speaking out, calling foreign interference a national security threat to Canada. Omar? Joy Malbin in Washington. Thank you. Prime Minister Trudeau is back on Canadian soil tonight after being stranded in India since Sunday. Trudeau, along with his son and the Canadian delegation, left after a technician fixed a mechanical issue on his plane. Tomorrow, the Prime Minister will join his caucus for a retreat in London, Ontario. And that is where we find CTV's Judy Trin tonight. Judy, what are Liberals telling you about what they see as their key vulnerabilities and what message do they want to deliver to Justin Trudeau? 
Omar, the Liberals know they are most vulnerable when it comes to cost of living issues, in particular, making housing affordable. Multiple polls show the Conservatives surging. One poll, an abacus one in particular, shows the Tories ahead by 14 points. That's a drop in support for the Liberals that hasn't been seen since 2015. Liberals are falling behind in support among younger constituents and women. Here's London MP Ariel Kayabega. I'm 32 years old. I'm a member of parliament. I haven't been able to purchase a home. I came here to this country as a refugee. I've been a single mom for the last uh, 14 years. And um, it, these are things that are not unique to just me. Behind the scenes, some backbenchers want the Liberals to go on the attack against Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, even though an election is two years away. But the majority of backbenchers just want the Prime Minister to come up with a plan that they can deliver to Canadians. Omar. Also a theme of last month's cabinet retreat. All right, Judy, thanks. When we come back. I've had COVID, yeah, it's not fun. No. Yeah. Yeah, so I would consider anything that would help alleviate a lot of the symptoms. Canadians roll up their sleeves as an updated vaccine rolls out. Plus, how a bear cam helped rescue a lost hiker. As the fall flu season nears, Health Canada approved a new shot for COVID-19. Infections and hospitalizations are starting to climb, and the country's top doctor is urging caution. By example, here's CTV's Jill Makishan. Canada's chief public health officer came to this briefing with a message and a mask. We have started to see an increase in COVID-19 indicators across many areas of the country, including hospitalizations. A new surge brought on by an evolving Omicron strain. And today, a newly approved vaccine targeting a subvariant, an updated mRNA-based shot by Moderna called SpikeVax for everyone six months and older. So the better our immune system is, the faster our immune system can chase down and shut down the infection quickly. The vaccine helps our immune system get that much smarter and faster at reacting. In Canada today, the COVID picture is not very clear. Information from some provinces and territories is not available. Still, COVID activity is considered moderate overall. Health Canada is reporting 48 deaths in the past week, more than 4,400 new cases. On this sunny day in Winnipeg, COVID concerns seem far away for some, closer for others. I don't know if this one is going to be as serious. You no, know, there's an insurgence of COVID cases coming back. It's like, then might as well get the updated one. Yeah. Keep yourself safe, our kids safe. Uh, yeah, I yeah. have. I've had COVID, yeah. It's not fun. No. Yeah. yeah, so I would consider anything that would help alleviate a lot of the symptoms. Health Canada is reviewing a submission by Pfizer for approval of its vaccine targeting the same Omicron subvariant and another by Novavax. Moderna is expected to start shipping its vaccine to Canada Wednesday. Jill Makishan, CTV News, Winnipeg. New developments tonight in the nearly two-week hunt for an escaped convict. Authorities in Pennsylvania say Daniello Cavalcante stole a 22 caliber rifle after confronting a homeowner in his garage late last night. The homeowner drew a pistol and fired at Cavalcante as he fled with the rifle. A search is focusing on an area 50 kilometers northwest of Philadelphia. Cavalcante broke out of prison August 31st. He was serving a life sentence for killing his ex-girlfriend. The much-anticipated debut of NFL star quarterback Aaron Rodgers in a New York Jets uniform lasted only four plays. He's now out for the season. Protection breaks down and time runs out. The 39-year-old was injured in last night's game against Buffalo. An MRI today revealed he tore his Achilles tendon. The injury is a major blow to both Rodgers and the Jets. The team brought him to the Big Apple in a blockbuster trade with Green Bay with the hope of turning the franchise into a contender. Still ahead, a core change for the Apple iPhone. Charging ahead with a new feature. Apple unveiled its newest iPhone today, but instead of the new bells and whistles grabbing the headlines, most of the talk is about a charging change. Here's CTV's John Venavelli Rao. Touted for its use of titanium, Apple says its latest and greatest pro iPhones are lighter than ever. 
You'll feel it as soon as you pick it up. The iPhone 15 also sporting an upgraded camera and colors, but getting the most attention, the change to how the phone gets charged. First introduced back in 2012, Apple annoyed some of its fans back then when it created its proprietary lightning port, forcing millions to buy new cables to work with their iPhones. I think the biggest takeaway here is the change in port. So we're bringing USB-C to iPhone 15. Now the iPhone is switching to another cable, USB-C, though only after facing intense pressure to do so. Apple fought this change tooth and nail for years. They would have been happy to sell lightning cables and chargers to us until the end of time. Uh, they made some pretty good money at it. Who else knows this problem? The change comes after the European Union mandated USB-C ports be required on all sorts of devices. So consumers would need just one type of charger instead of carrying around a rat's nest of cables. It's a huge victory for consumers, huge victory for uh, the environment. Apple already uses USB-C for many of its other devices. And now finally, the iPhone, which goes on sale later this week. John Venavelli Rouse, CTV News, Toronto. And here's a moment that was worth grabbing your phone camera for today. A truck spilled a massive load of white paint on a major highway in Montreal. Officials closed the area off, but not before several cars drove through the spill, creating an even bigger mess. Quebec police say the driver may be fined if the paint wasn't properly secured. A new kind of street art. After the break, rescued in real time. The lost hikers saved by some wild footage. We leave you tonight with a walk on the wild side that quickly turned into a daring rescue in one of the world's most remote parks, all thanks to a distress call caught on camera. In his first report as our newest correspondent, CTV Scott Hurst follows the digital trail. Millions of people every year are glued to these live feeds to marvel at Alaska's rugged scenery and majestic wildlife. But this moment was something these cameras had never captured before. My first reaction was to like, not panic and confirm that something was indeed happening. One of those eagle-eyed bear enthusiasts watching the live stream was Chelsea Pruitt. I've been keeping a close eye on that camera that day and saw no bears, but I did see a distressed man. A lone hiker, soaking wet and lost, can be seen walking up to the camera and pleading for help. He said, help. He said, I don't know which direction to go. But a rescue team knew exactly where to find him. He was cold and alone, but alive and escorted off the mountain. They were able to get rangers up there within two hours. These cameras have become wildly popular in recent years for an annual fat bear contest, a bracket style competition comparing how well the bears are bulking up before hibernation. I'm really grateful that our cameras were in the right place at the right time for him. Officials at the Katmai National Park say there's an ongoing investigation into the incident. As for the group in charge of the cameras, it's a wild encounter they won't soon forget. Scott Hurst, CTV News, Toronto. A remarkable remote intervention. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.